<laughs> I am officially an old man today. Had a birthday yesterday, turned 55. 45, I went through middle age crisis. At 55, I've decided it's just good to have another birthday. So I'm just going to keep having birthdays as long as I can. If y'all want to break into singing chorus, happy birthday to me, you can go right ahead. Never mind. No, that's fine. Oh, great. To me, happy birthday to Oh, boy. Happy birthday to me. Yes, it is. You thought I was kidding. The apple didn't fall far from that tree. Guys, there is something that I'd like to introduce you to. Um, Jeff is going to pull it up on the screen. Well, let me, as Jeff pulls it up on the screen, let me start out by saying this. This is a nonprofit ministry of BPO that Phil does. We're so thankful that C Spire hosts us and provides this facility each week, provides the breakfast for us, provides the coffee, the meeting space at no expense. But BPO is a nonprofit organization uh, and, and they do accept tithes. They do accept gifts and it may help if we would give some so we could have a screen that would work over here. So let's just play off that for the morning that uh, seriously, Deer Camp funds are available out in the front table in the lobby uh, for those that may want to give toward that uh, mission of Deer Camp to help with uh, those that may not be in a position that they can afford the, the uh, fees to go to Deer Camp. It's a wonderful ministry that Phil has. But also along with that, um, Mr. Maxwell and I <clears throat> went to high school together and he is publishing on the internet um, something called Mississippi Matters. And uh, Joe is an, is, a, is an incredibly gifted writer um, and he is using those talents to put together kind of an online magazine. And in that uh, will be small clips, as you see there, this two and a half minute clip from uh, one of our roundtable meetings. And he will do that once a week. And it's a way of beginning to spread more through social media in a different outlet about this meeting, to invite more men here, to let them know about what uh, the roundtable is about. And I would encourage you to ask, if you would please write down in your notes, Mississippi Matters, go to their Facebook page um, and like it, and then please share it. It's a way for us to get the word out to other men about this ministry and for them to be able to be exposed to it just very briefly and get an idea of what it's about. If you would do that, that would be appreciated. You know, just with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for being here. We thank you for C Spire, for hosting us, Lord, for opening up their doors. We thank you for Phil and his preparedness each week. Lord, more than that, we thank you for being here with each man. Each man represents a family, whether it's a family of one or a family of many. There is a family that's touched here, Lord, by every man. I ask that you would open our hearts now, receive the message that Phil brings us. We do all of these things because of your son who died for us first and loves us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. <clears throat> A power greater than me. Thank you, Jesus. A power greater than me. Um, I have a song this morning um, that um, talks about power, and it's the evil power that wars against us. Uh, Brantley Gilbert says this related to the song, The Devil Don't Sleep. It's also the title of his new album. The Devil Don't Sleep is all about knowing that the devil is always there, and there's always temptation. Gilbert explains, it just keeps me on my toes, and it's just kind of a constant reminder to me to move forward and keep my nose in the right direction. One of the temptations Gilbert speaks of is alcohol. Though he's been sober for more than five years, he still considers himself to be in the recovery process. Quote, decisions are always there to make, and the devil don't sleep for me means always just being aware that I am an addict, Gilbert notes. I'm a recovering addict, but I'll always be an addict. Those temptations are there, 
there's a lot of roads that go left, unquote. You may not describe yourself as an addict, uh, but we are all sinners. Welcome, sinners, to our men's roundtable meeting. I want to play this song for you. Uh, the words are on the back of your notes. Consider the words. Listen to the music. May God open your heart to what he has for us this morning. May you hear the voice of God. <clears throat> Devil don't sleep, he never shuts his Be on the alert, stand firm in your faith, act like men, be strong. Words from 1 Corinthians 16, 13. 12 steps, a classic model for spiritual growth. Today we look at step two, a power greater than me. As Howard says, no, that is not Carla. But it could be. It could be. A power greater than me. It is a sad state in a man's life 
when he believes that he is the biggest cat in the woods. Right? That is a dangerous place. Invincible, in control, that it really is about him in his mind, it's a dangerous place to be. And God has a way of bringing us to our knees. And last week we looked at step one, and step one is the whole idea of surrender. I cannot control my life. I need help. So last week, if we're following the steps, we bowed our knee, we submitted, we surrendered. And now we're faced with, okay, now what? There's like this vacuum at this point if we're walking through the 12 steps. We've surrendered. Now what do we do? What do you grab hold of when there's nothing to grab hold of? I you to pick up your pen and work with me here. I've got four questions this morning. This first question is about fear. We're working with fear. In what areas, your personal life, your vocational life, your faith life, do you have reoccurring fears that aren't grounded in sound evidence? Now, let me help you with that as you're thinking about that. It's easy to say, well, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid. Well, uh, you know, I'm taking about 100 milligrams of Wellbutrin, uh, and I'm having panic attacks where I can't even go into Walmart uh, anymore, but I'm not afraid of anything. I just have some anxiety issues. Dude, that's fear. That's fear. I recently sat with a man, literally, and he was in Walmart, and he thought he was going to have to call 911 to get him out of Walmart because he started having a panic attack. And those of you who have had panic attacks, you know that when you have a panic attack in a public place, even in a private place for that matter, you think you're dying. You think you're having a heart attack. This is it. This is the big one. But what fears do you have? Second question deals with others. How's that other thing working? Seems like they have all the power. So the question is, whom do you continue to resent periodically or constantly, and how does your resentment manifest itself? Resentment. Some of you have really, really good mother-in-laws, and then there's the rest of you. <laughs> you know, she seemed really good at the wedding reception, but it was after that wedding cake that things kind of spun out of control. Your boss, some authority figure in your life, and it may even be your wife, your kids. You know, it was easy when you were making peanut butter sandwiches and changing diapers. And now they're 19 and 29. What do you do? They're out of control. Whom is in your life that makes it hard? All right, third question is your own self-defeating behaviors. You know, ready, aim, shoot myself in the foot sort of thing. Which self-defeating behaviors do you continue to engage in even though it is not in your best interest to continue? Overeating, using drugs or alcohol, entering destructive relationships, gambling, compulsive talking, procrastination, just can't get anything done. Recently sat with a man and uh, he's in his 50s and he got entangled with a guy in his 70s and he was cussing and yelling at the 70-year-old guy, telling that he was going to beat him up. Really, dude? Really? You're 50, and you're going to beat up on a 70-year-old guy? Yeah, but you don't know what that 70-year-old guy said to me.
you know, it's kind of reversed. You know, on the playground, when a 15-year-old is beaten up on a five-year-old, we call that bullying. But when a 50-year-old is beaten up on a 70-year-old, we call that bullying somehow. But he was just out of control. Self-defeating behaviors. Could not control his anger. So he's sitting in front of me saying, man, I, I need help. I need help. Fourth question or decisions, your choices. What decisions have you made or things you have done that were crazy? Stupid is what we're talking about there, just for translation's sake. That is things that you did even though you knew the consequences could be harmful to you. Sexually acting out, financial decisions, relational decisions, not controlling your emotions, choices that you made. <laughs> yeah, I, have, I have another pen, Howard, for you. Yeah, exactly. Anybody need more paper? Ron will get you some more paper. Guys, the whole point of these questions is to alert us that we need a power greater than ourselves. This is just a way to think about the illusion that we have that we can control things and the guilt that we then experience when we can't control things. And that is the essence of sin. It is, it is way, way, way too general just to say, I've read enough of my Bible to know that I'm a sinner and I need to confess my sins. And so, dear Jesus, I confess my sin. Mm -mm, no. That is not the way you confess sin. That's called a generalist. It's kind of like, you know, those guys on TV that's, They've done something wrong, and they get on uh, TV, and there's the news reporters, and they say, you know, I just want to acknowledge, if I have hurt anybody, I'm sorry. If I've hurt anybody, dude, you know, the reason we're having this news report is because there's about 100 people out here that are ready to kill you. You have hurt. You know, it's like Steve Martin, like when Steve Martin does that routine, and he says, you know, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Thank you, 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 thank you. And he spends about 10 minutes thanking everybody in the auditorium. It's hilarious. That's kind of the way we need to do our sin. You know, all the people that I've hurt in this room, I'd like to start with Mike and just work my way down the, down, down the aisle. My illusion, delusion that I can control my life and then the guilt that I feel when I can't control my life is what sin is about. And I need to be more specific. I need to get involved in the game and participate. But the good news is there is a power greater than me. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. That's the verse I would encourage you to memorize and meditate on relative to today's session. Step number two, a greater than me. God's working. God's working in me. Now, again, as we begin today's session, there's the whole overview of the 12 steps that we've been working with. The goal uh, is peace and keeping the peace. That's what we're trying to do. I just want some peace. Life is so cre uh, uh, chaotic. And God promises peace. Peace I give you. And in order to experience that peace, the 12 steps God has given us through men that develop this through Scripture, a whole set of disciplines, starting with submission or surrender that we looked at last week, and now we're into step two. And we need to be converted. We need to have a heart change. Surrender, laying your guns on the table and surrendering and saying, I can't. I can't do this is a great beginning. Rather than clenching your fist and saying, I can. No, you can't. It's bigger than you. 
Open up your hand. I can't. And so it looks something like this. And you can kind of sketch this out just to have a conceptual view of what we're looking at this morning. Step two begins with a willingness to believe. You got to believe. What do you believe in? You got to believe. And the idea there when we're working with that is restoring hope. When I sit with a man who is devastated, a couple who is struggling, I want them to have hope by the end of the session. And I'll say, often say, and I believe it, you're going to get through this. You know, keep working with me. We'll get through this. I don't know what that looks like exactly, but God's working in your life. God's brought you here to this place. He's working in your life. And what we invite them to do is enter a faith journey, the faith process. And what you've got to do is you've got to start acknowledging what you trust in. What do you trust? Life is about trust. Right now, consider what do you trust in? What do you believe? Your ability to control it? Your ability to make it work? Trust. And then what we've got to do, we've got to slow it down enough to where we restore sanity. And that's simply nothing more than, than saying we've got to bring it to order. Recently sat uh, with a couple, and they were in my office because the whole family is a train wreck. You know, mama's mad, siblings are mad, in-laws, outlaws, they're all mad. I mean, it was a complete mess and they don't know what to do. Seems like every time they start shooting one direction, somebody behind them shooting from the other direction. And I said, well, what we're going to do is slow everything down, and we've got to restore order at least to your life first. You know, kind of get in the Alamo, behind the walls, settle down, let's get a plan and quit running around the Alamo wall, shooting in every direction, not knowing what you're going to do. You got to, you got to have a plan. You got to have order. So here's what we're going to do. First of all, a willingness to believe. When we go through the 12 steps, and we're really working the 12 steps as a way to grow, and we come to that step one, as I mentioned earlier, we surrender. That's a great first step. But now there's a void. And what we've got to do in that void is go to a willingness to believe. Step two says that our, after admitting one's powerlessness, all that is required to begin this faith journey is a willingness to believe. No content, no creed, no church affiliation, no religious experience, just a willingness, a sense of openness to a higher power, quote unquote. First comes awareness of one's powerlessness to solve the most basic problems one is facing. But guys, this, this is a point of tension for those of us who are Bible-believing Christians. Typically, when I mention that idea of the AA's label, higher power, in a Christian environment, there's red flags, goes up. Oh, no, oh, no, we're talking about higher power. Can't talk about higher power. I understand the tension, and I do believe that the higher power is the God of the universe who is seen in the person of Jesus Christ. And the only way that we can truly have life is by uh, putting our faith in the provision of Jesus for our sin that then gives us eternal life and being known by God through eternity. That is the gospel. But I do believe that this whole process is a journey. 
And it would be foolish for a man who comes to you, who comes to me, and he doesn't believe in anything, and I'm trying to convince him that he's got to believe in the God that I believe in on that day, or I can't work with him. That doesn't make any sense. What I want him to do is believe, and, and just believe in our process, if nothing else. I want him to believe in a doorknob, if nothing else, and stick the key in the doorknob. Believe in the doorknob. The door will open. I don't care what he believes in initially because I want to take him through a process of understanding that as he believes and he has hope and he begins to trust in something and order is restored to his life, that there's going to be a day where he's going to believe in the God that I believe in in the God of the universe, but it's a process. I want to read you something that explains this a little bit better than I can, I believe. Um, Keith Miller is a book uh, that I'm using as a resource through this uh, series, A Hunger for Healing. I want you to follow with me um, in a couple of paragraphs here that Keith Miller talks about this process of just a willingness to believe. He's a recovering alcoholic himself, a recovering addict. So he says this, I came into a 12-step program as a Christian with a graduate degree in theology and a serious commitment of my life to Christ that I'd been trying to live for 29 years. I just knew this higher power or doorknob approach to God was not the way you were supposed to do faith. I was a little horrified, in fact, and I thought to myself, quote, this faith in God is serious business. They're going to lead people astray and get into big trouble here, unquote. But my own pain was severe and my faith was not working. So I kept silent and listened and watched. The months went by and I had a very humbling experience. As I watched the higher power reveal itself to various people in the group, its personality always had certain definite familiar characteristics. I knew that if everyone were making up their own higher power, this wouldn't happen. It couldn't. The personality of the higher power revealed in those meetings was always loving and forgiving, gave people however many new starts they needed to get into recovery and to get well was rigorously honest, moral, courageous, and strong, but never abusive, and was loyal beyond belief whether people deserved it or not. In fact, as I looked carefully at the higher power in this 12-step program, I realized that it had a haunting family resemblance to Jesus Christ. It's a process. I learned that several of the founders of AA were Christians and had Episcopal and Catholic priests as friends and advisors when they hammered out the 12 steps and the approach to God. I remembered Christ's words when he spoke about a man who was casting out demons but was not his follower. And this is in Mark chapter 9, 39 through 40, when Jesus said, Do not forbid him. For he that is not against us is for us. This guy was casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and his disciples comes up and says, no, 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 you can't do that. You're not one of us, so you can't do that. And Jesus said, no, he's not against us. He'll eventually come around. He'll eventually come around. Jesus knew that the God the man was referring to was the same God, even though the man healing wasn't a follower of Jesus. He knew that God was alive and could do his healing work wherever he was called on in faith. As my own years in the 12-step program has gone by, I have found that my faith in God and Jesus Christ has been strengthened and made more real through working the steps. And this has been true for many people I know because people coming to the program almost always develop a great hunger to know more about God. Many of them go to churches and become Christians. In the past three years, more than 20 12-step meetings have begun to convene every week in our church. Many people have come from these meetings into membership classes to join our congregation. In the last analysis, Jesus seemed to feel that it is by their fruits that you shall know them, Matthew 7, 19. Do they just talk about God or do they change and deal with their disease behaviors is the question. 
guys, we can be so judgmental. <laughs> like, you know, you've been walking with God for five years or 50 years, and you meet some guy, and he's talking craziness about God, and you kind of want him to get up to your speed before you're going to accept him into your little group. That is so wrong. It is so wrong. Now, in my theology classes, what they're afraid of is antinomianism. Everybody knows what antinomianism is, right? <laughs> I see a lot of cross eyes right here. Antinomian is simply a theological big word that talks about against the law. It's like, oh my goodness, you're going to be antinomian which means that you would have no standard and it would be just complete liberalism and you just believe in anything you want to. It's like there's no lime on the playing field because you're so accepting. You're too grace-oriented is what they say. Dude, I pray that I am too grace-oriented accused. I stand accused. I in no way want to compromise God's law. I have great respect for the lime on the playing field that God's given us. But if I'm going to be criticized, I want to be criticized for not accepting sinners like myself, guys who are broken, guys who have failed, guys who have brought shame and guilt to their own lives and to their families' lives. And we can love on them and bring them in, and they can believe anything they want to initially because we're trying to bring them down the chute to the pool of grace, the water slide of grace. Woo! Yo! Splash! Right there. How's that for a visual image? That's your video clip for today. <laughs> but, I, but I'm serious on this. I in no way want to compromise who God is in your life or my life. But what I want you to do is I want you to get involved in a process of learning how to have hope and trust restored. Let me just give you just a quick story where, where I learned this. I've told this story before. Of course, as John knows, I've told all my stories before. So, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years. I've only got a, a few stories, you know. Um, I was in campus ministry with Campus Crusade for Christ years ago uh, uh, at Penn State working with college students, and we had this meeting, large meeting. It was kind of like a, a, a big meeting room like this in the student union, and we would just have an open forum, and one of our guys, either me or one of our other team, would speak, and we would have 300 students just sitting on the floor in a big open area like this, sharing the gospel. And on one of our uh, meetings, this guy comes in from the side, kind of over here where Jeff is. By the way, Jeff's in timeout this morning. I just wanted to mention that. Um <laughs> And so, and so this guy, he looks like a hell's angel. I mean, big bushy hair, the uh, jean jacket with the arms cut out, big old arms. Uh, you know, it's just like, oh, my goodness. And he starts walking from the side, and he's walking toward our speaker. And I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus, that I'm not speaking tonight. <laughs> and uh, Dave uh, was our speaker, and I'm watching this. And it's like, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? And this guy, he sits down right here, right up front. He sits down, and I'm watching him, and I'm watching. I didn't know if he was going to grab the microphone or grab Dave, you know? And uh, so the meeting goes on. The meeting ends, and I'm in the back, and I'm trying to get to him because I want to engage him and, you know, see what he's all about. Well, I get involved in a bunch of conversations, and I can't get to him. So by the time I get my way through the crowd, he's gone. We passed out comment cards that night, and we were dividing them up, people who wanted more interest, who indicated that they had received Christ that night. I get a guy's name, Joe Androsi, just a name and a phone number. I call the guy up, invite him to have a Coke with me at the union um, a couple of days later. I show up. We uh, designate the place we meet. I, I, I show up. Oh, my goodness, it's the dude. It's the dude, Joe Androsi. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. Uh, I got to watch what I say. And we sit together, and he is interested in the things of God. I mean, I was just, like, shocked. I mean, where, where is my belief? And, uh, you know, I give him a Bible. I give him some things to read. 
come back the next week. Uh, we meet and I said, well, Joe, did you, did you read your Bible? And he said, man, dude, I rolled me a couple of joints last night and I smoked some weed and, and, and I read those verses. Man, it was incredible, dude. It was awesome. <laughs> this ain't Sunday school. I, that's all I can say, you know. And I said, "Well, great, Joe. That's that's fantastic. Tell tell me what you learned." You know, he's telling me what he's learning. He's, he's, I'm thinking, okay, this this is not exactly what they said in the manual. You know, when guy says he smokes weed, what to do? You know, and so okay, so that's cool. You know, and I I give him a couple more uh, verses and tell him what to do and let's meet back here next week and i said joe did you really? dude i got some new weed in roll the joints man i smoked some weed read the verses i mean this is an honest truth story smoked that weed man those verses were great i wanted to ask him well, did you, were you eating potato chips at the same time I know. Cheese, <laughs> cheese pizza that was cheese pizza yeah so anyway this goes on for about three weeks I, I never mentioned the weed. I was just like, I'm kind of laughing and horrified at the same time. You know, what do I say? What do I do? You can't, you can't smoke weed and read the Bible. You know, you can't do that. And uh, so I, uh, I continued in about the fourth week. Joe said, he said, dad, he said, I feel like God's speaking to me. I said, what's he saying? He said, well, he said, I, I'm starting to feel like maybe I shouldn't be smoking weed and reading my Bible. <laughs> true story, true story, true story. And so, so I said, well, he said, what should I do? And I said, well, I'd listen to God. That's all I said. I'd listen to God. True story. Joe Andros, he kept growing in Christ. And the last that I heard of Joe years ago, uh, he went down to Mexico and he was um, uh, um, leading an orphanage across the border in Mexico, Joe Androsi. Now, if the first time I got together with him, I'd have said, now, Joe, you shouldn't be smoking that weed. Not that I would say smoke more weed. I, I wouldn't say that. But my point is, don't get lost in your own legalism when a guy doesn't believe like you believe. Love him. Keep giving him the truth. He'll get it. God's in charge, not you. That's the point. Authentic faith. Just be willing to grow. I'm going to show you just the need for a higher power. Bill Wilson, part of the founder uh, pair, uh, Dr. Bob and Bill W. that started um, AA. This is a sad, sad, sad clip. But it's illustrative of you and me when we get in that desperate place and we need a power greater than ourselves. Watch this. I can't get all the pranks. Where is it? How bad is it? Everybody's getting called in. They're marching. They're closed all the time. Get to a phone. Good luck. You watch me, pal. I'm not going down with everybody else. I can play it out. Hey, Todd. I gotta get some phone. What do you do for me? They're all tied up, Mr. Wilson. You must have something, huh? Use one in the back room. Great. Thanks. Right, Don't forget out. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, give me Bowling Green 0075, please. Hold on, yes? Yeah? Hello? Oh, Nate, good man, right where I need you. Yeah, where's Shaw? Huh? Thank you, huh? Uh-huh. Oh, how bad is it? Uh-huh. Mm. Okay, so what can we salvage? Uh-huh. 
Okay, listen to me. Dump to Portland in the GE. Sell Emerson only if you have to. And please tell Dink to stop pushing him so hard. Yeah, you're a good man. Bye. Sid, hi. Bill Wilson. Yeah, whew, boy, I know. Well, there's always a port in a storm, and boy, have I got me one. Panic and four. Safe bet. Solid. <laughs> Solid as a rock. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Hey, <laughs> no problem, Sid. Yeah, next time. Right. I called everywhere, Evie. No one's seen him at all. I was hoping that you might... He was here before. He, he looked as crazy as everyone else around here, but he's gone now. You are not notifying me, Dink. I know, but Nate said, said we have a couple of hours. I said two or three hours. No, you're not. Dink, you're... Hello? Dink. Yes, who is it? This is your landlord, Mrs. Olsen. Bill? Honey, Bill, come up, please. I said it's your landlord. And bad news to you. You're being dispossessed the first of the month. It's over. Bill? You hear me? It's over. trying to control and then feeling guilty because you can't. That's what sin is. I mean, there's so much in that clip. The frantic desperation, the attempt to say whatever needs to be said, to lie, cheat, swindle, manipulate, attempt to control and then feeling guilty, shame because it's not working. The faith process starts with just the act of believing. A man may say, I don't know if I can believe in God. Okay, that's fine. Just believe in our process. Just believe in coming in and sitting with me. Just believe that I'll walk with you. Find some sense of connection, some sense of traction, and just start the process of believing. Change the focus from a cycle of self-absorption and attempts to control unmanageable problems and get out of that self-centeredness characterized by shame and fear and allow God to begin to work. But your self-absorption your attempt to control and your self-centeredness is what's blocking. You got to be real. Tell your story. Be honest. You got to believe. You got to believe. I'm amazed at the number of men that I sit with that are caught up in that anxiety, that shame, and that fear. And they really believe that medication will help that. It will. You know what medication does? It just masks over the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. You know, it's like when you go to the doctor and you get a steroid. Half the time, the doctor doesn't know what's wrong. He just knows that the steroid will, <laughs> 
Billy says, don't give that out. He just, he's helping you to feel better, but he doesn't know, you know? But it's, but it's this idea, do you really want to know what the problem is? And the problem is that deep, dark heart problem. You've got to believe. So what we've got to do is go to this final step. We'll close with this. Is you've got to restore sanity. A power greater than me. You've got to be wise. You know, a synonym for sanity is wise. So we've got to restore wisdom. We need to gain humility enough to face that it's not natural or wise or sane to be in emotional turmoil all the time, to be fearful, anxious, resentful, or picky. This sort of turmoil results from our compulsive need to control, and that is our sin disease. Unless we recognize that continuing this behavior in our lives is insane, we can't recover. We cannot really own our own powerlessness. You know what insanity looks like? This. That's what insanity looks like. You know what trust looks like? Dear Jesus, I receive my daily manna. You know what I need for today. Give me what I need. I will trust you. I am scared to death. My son is out of control. My daughter's out of control. My wife wants to leave me. My business is failing. I don't know, but I will trust you. A new awareness that what you have been doing is part of the problem and that you've got to own your own behavior. You've got to take responsibility. I'll close with this, 1 John chapter 1. I want you to listen to this in this context. I have a need for a greater power than me. But if we're living in the light of God's presence, just as Christ is, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. I just want to live in the light. Part of living in the light is knowing uh, how you are trying to control and your guilt. And it's also asking for feedback that you're willing to hear what a jerk you are and how difficult you are to live with with those that love you. It's like, I don't want, I, I don't want anybody telling me that. Dude, that's part of it. It's like looking into the mirror that you have in your bathroom, and it's like you stand in front of that mirror, and you say, mirror, mirror on the wall, I am the greatest of them all. But it's a whole different mirror when you look into the eyes of your wife and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, how am I doing? If we say we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves. And again, not sin in a general way, but if we say that we're not controlling and that we don't feel shame and guilt about what we're doing or not doing, we're kidding ourselves. We're only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, tell our story, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. If we claim we've not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Guys, if I say, that I don't need God, either consciously or unconsciously. Most of us are smarter, smart enough to not say that consciously. But if we're saying it under our breath, we call God a liar. God, I need you. I am so needy. I'm not the biggest cat in the woods. I need a power greater than myself. Step two, welcome. Glad you're here. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much um, for this framework to help us understand our own need and who you are. Uh, you are the highest power of all. You are Lord of all the universe. There is no one greater than you. We bow our knee to you. We love you. Thank you for bringing us here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Have a great week.